Good morning. Yeah, I thought there was other things happening before that. There you go. Took me by surprise. <clears throat> well, I don't know where you are on the spectrum of your personality. Uh, some people are just really kind of, they're fun-loving, happy people, aren't they? Um, obviously, nobody in here today, I can <laughs> um, But if you're like me, it's a kind of, it's, it's more what's missing rather than what's there. You tend to... So, in other words, we have to learn some things in life. Some things, for some people, are a lot more natural, but even for those, they still have to learn. And, um, and so... One of the things that we need to learn is to realize that God is a God who restores our joy. He's a God of abundant joy. He's a God who loves to laugh. He's a God who loves to make jokes. Jesus made jokes, yes. They were jokes of exaggeration. And so it's important for you and I to learn to be full of joy. That does not mean to say, of course, that, uh, that life is always roses or that life is easy. And as we go through today's teaching, hopefully you'll get a realization from the life of Paul that actually that even in the most horrendous of situations, you can alter your focus and become a person of joy. You can become something that's internal, that doesn't depend on on the external things. But if you're anything like me, so often we focus on the externals and, uh, and that, that often determines our uh, happiness in life, doesn't it? But for all of us, we need joy in our life. It isn't something that's just nice to have. It is actually an essential part of our being for us to be healthy mentally and emotionally Joy matters, yes? It's going to really affect uh, how we go through our day. Without joy, life is overwhelming. Without joy, it's, uh, it, it's dull. Without joy, uh, we, we get down and we get depressed and we focus on the negative things. We can become oppressed when we don't have joy in our life. But what they've seen so many through so many studies is that joy actually can produce energy. It will change your demeanor. It will change uh, the, the, you physically when you have joy in your life. Amen? You'll have more energy. You'll have more creativity. Um, you'll have more friends <laughs> if you're full of joy. Um, uh, instead of being Billy Nomades, you'll actually have some friends because people will realize that there's, there's something in you that is attractive. Jesus was attractive. He, the children love to be with him. The thing is, is children don't like to be with people that are grumps, do they? And if you're anything like me, I don't want to be with people that are grumps, yes? You want to be people that are joyful, don't you? That are going to kind of uh, liven your day, say something into your life, something positive, into your life. And God is the God of exceeding joy. Psalm 43, in the Hebrew, it is uh, El Simkath Galai, and it means, I am the God of exceeding joy. So God is a God of joy, and so therefore, he wants us to be a people of joy. God is a God of overflowing, abundant joy uh, in, in every aspect. But when we're going to talk about joy, the book in the Bible that is really the, the, the ultimate on, on joy is the book of Philipp Philippians. It is a very small book. It's only got four chapters. Um, it kind of would seem, in, in terms of uh, the amount of content, uh, would seem rather uh, insignificant in comparison to some of the other books of the Bible. But actually, its message is one of the most powerful messages in the whole Bible. Sixteen times in these four chapters, Paul says, rejoice. Rejoice always, enjoy life, 
Um, you know, focus your life on God and you will have joy in your life. Now, the amazing thing about this book, the book is all about joy, is that Paul did not write this while he was on a Mediterranean cruise. <laughs> yes? Because uh, sometimes when we, we think somebody's going to write something really positive, we would expect their circumstances to be kind of, they're living on easy street, they're on holiday, they're enjoying it, like the sun is shining, um, they've, uh, they've got something like a nice hot chocolate in their hand or something like that, that, uh, that they're enjoying life. But actually, Paul, when he wrote this, was in prison. In fact, all his friends had deserted him. He was alone, he was old, he was knocking on a little bit in age when he did this, and he was waiting to be executed. He was on death row. So that, I think, is amazing to think that here is Paul, chained to soldiers, them, them soldiers chained, were chained to him, um, so he couldn't go anywhere, he couldn't go to the toilet without somebody with him, he was chained 24 hours a day, and, uh, and everybody had deserted him, and yet here in this opportunity, he decides to write the most joyful book in the Bible. That, that, that says everything, doesn't it? That joy is not dependent on your circumstances, it's very much an inside job for this. And so today I want to look at what Paul talks about, how we can have joy in our lives. And uh, from, the, from the, 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 the book of Philippians, we're going to look at some of the aspects of it. And we're going to see that, that Paul had six joy builders, that if we apply these to our life, they will enable us to have joy in our life, abundant joy in our life. So we, the, we've got to apply them just listening to them and hearing about them will not make a blind bit of difference in your life, so you've got to apply it. But if you apply it, it will work like magic in your life. And the first thing that we've got to do, if we want to, uh, to have joy in our life, uh, because there's enough things in life that will, will take our joy away, aren't there, um, things, is we've got to jettison all regrets about our past. We have got to, jettison means to throw overboard. So, for example, if you're in an aeroplane and they, they're needing to kind of, uh, uh, to get rid of things because they need to stay lighter, they would throw unnecessary things overboard. They would throw them out of the aeroplane. Now, hopefully that wouldn't be you and I that they'd throw out, thinking they're a bit needless. But, um, but same with on a ship. And so, of course, in ships, uh, when they went through storms, they'd often have to be lighter to survive the storm, and so they would throw all sorts of things out. And we know one of the stories of Paul, when he goes through that, that they've thrown everything overboard and still the storm, and they recognize that this is a God thing, and eventually they realize that actually the, 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 that, uh, they're going to get shipwrecked. And, they get, you know, and, and of course, um, that was the same issue with Job, wasn't it? In the Old Testament, they threw everything overboard, and eventually they had to throw Job overboard for them to survive. So, uh, so that's what it means to jettison, means to get rid of, yes? To throw away, to discard uh, things. And so if you want to have joy in your life, there are some things that you have got to jettison. There are some things that you've got to get rid of, that you've got to eliminate from your life if you're able to do that. And, uh, and so the, the, the thing that I'm saying today that Paul talks about is you have got to get rid of all your regrets about the past. And so this is so important for us to do that. Now, Sir Arthur Coyne Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes uh, uh, series, decided to play a prank on some of his friends, some really well-known Englishmen. And so what he did is he sent them a note, and the note simply said, all has been found out. That's all he said on the note. He sent it from, uh, from, from, from him, signed it by his name. And within 24 hours, every single one of those, I think it was about eight men, left the country. <laughs> and he did it as a prank because he wanted to see how they would respond. Now, I don't know about you, but I think for all of us, 
there are regrets in our life. There are things that we regret, decisions we've made, uh, connections we've done, whatever it might be, things that we have uh, done in our life that maybe we regret. And we all have regrets in our life. It's not that that's just for certain people. For all of us, do have regrets in our life. And I'm sure that if I was able to kind of, maybe if I was to say to you, all has been found out, and you believed that, I wonder how you would respond. You would probably run out of the service as fast as you could. Now, I hope you don't do that. But, uh, but what I'm saying is so often there are hidden things in our life that we have regrets over, and so often they will hold us back from having joy because we are, we are holding on to them, and instead of getting rid of them and say, realizing we cannot do anything about those regrets, we cannot change the past, therefore there's no point thinking about it, worrying about it, and, um, and, and, and being concerned about them. We have got to do that, because regret doesn't work. It's not going to give you joy in your life if you're all the time going on thinking, I regret this, I regret that. Um, whatever it might be, for all of us it could be very different things and it could be a multiple of things and for some people it might be kind of thing, oh yeah, I regret this and you regret that and whatever. We could uh, we think of that. But when we think about those things, it makes us miserable. You can't think about your regrets and be happy at the same time. You've got to get rid of of those. And so the problem is, is we get stuck in the land of if only. If only I had done this. If only I had said this. If only I had gone there instead of there. Whatever. And we have n- numerous regrets. But the problem is, is we can't change the past. We can't redo the past. We can't go back, back and make a different decision about what uh, of the things that we've done. But one of the great things is is to realize that when we make mistakes, when we have regrets, that we can come to God and say, God, I regret this, and I ask you to change my life. I ask you to forgive me. Now, the moment you do that, God says that he forgets it. God says that he forgives it. In fact, he says that he puts it in the, the, the deepest of seas, and, um, and then he puts a sign up that says, no fishing. So in other words, when God forgets something, surely to goodness, we can. If God's willing to forget something that we regret, then when we bring it to him, then surely we can do the same in our life. Because the Bible says, their sins I will remember no more. Isn't that fantastic? So when we blow it, God says, that's okay. Come to me, apologize turn around, do things differently, but we can, but, but I'm not going to bring it up ever again. Isaiah 43 says this, forget what happened in the past and don't dwell on events from long ago because I am going to do something new. Amen. God wants to do something new and he wants us, and the only way we're going to do something new in our life is when we have joy in our life, when we have a, a praising spirit this morning at the prayer meeting, I was talking about that, 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 that um, uh, Nehemiah 8 and verse 10 talks about the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, our energy, our vibrancy comes from the joy of the Lord. When we're in his presence, he, he changes things. He, 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 he changes what the past is, and uh, he can change it and make something good out of that. That's what he is able to do. So the starting point for joy is that we uh, uh, jettison the past, amen, the regrets that we have in the past, and we start uh, to to, uh, bring them to God and ask God to, to help us in the way that we are with them. Because sometimes, you know, you make a, 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 de- a decision and you regret the decision, but sometimes you've got to live every day with that decision. And when you're facing that decision every day, it can be hard to live with because it's like you've got a daily reminder of the decision that you made. And so when we have to jettison them regrets, it could be a daily thing that we need to do. Amen? That we've got to keep coming back and saying, I, 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 that might be something that I regret, but I'm not going to focus on it. I'm going to bring it to God again. The second thing that we need to do is we need to, and I've done the acrostic joyful 
uh, for you to be able to hopefully remember it or remember some of it. Uh, the O is for omit all worries about the future. So in other words, thinking about the past doesn't work and thinking and worrying about the future, uh, it doesn't work either. Yes, <clears throat> because sometimes we, we, we can get so worried about the things of the future that it, it stops us having joy in the moment. You can't be worried and joyful at the same time. Yes, if you're worrying about something, then you're obviously not praying about it. Because if you're praying about something, you're leaving it with God for God to, to, to think. The problem with worry is we start to make something bigger than it is. It, it grows when, the more that we, we worry about something. We make molehills into mountains. We, 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 we make it larger uh, in our mind than what it actually is. And so we've got to realize we can't change the past and we can't change the future because God holds the future. Yes, we don't know what lies around the, around the corner. And okay, we can plan and we can make our plans. At the end of the day, we don't really know what's going to happen. Let's just say, for imagine if we were in Ukraine today, you could have made all sorts of plans, but then once the bombs start to go, everything is out of the window. But even in a situation like that, you can have joy in your life because you're not worried about the future and you're not, you, you know, you're not worried about the past and you're able to live in the moment with the presence of God. You know that God has things in hand. And it's something that that's, 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 can often be easy to say, but it's hard to do. Because when things are going around you, and you imagine for those in Ukraine where things are and they're running for their lives, and I believe as a country and as a people, we need to be open to the people that are running for their lives. It's amazing when I listen to some people talk and they say, well, it's not our problem. Why should we do this? Why should we do that? And I think that's just, to, and I'll come on to that later about being selfish. It's important for us to realize that we can, we, we actually will be filled with joy when we help others. So we've got to omit all the worries about the past. Yes, if we worry about it, it's not going to make any difference. The old English word for worry <clears throat> uh, means to choke or to strangle. Today we would probably say a necktie of some kind. In other words, if you tie it tight and the more you worry about it, the tighter it gets. And what will it do? It will eventually the blood flow will stop or whatever, you won't be able to breathe, it will. And that's what happens with worry. It just gets, as it were, tighter and tighter around us that we suffocates the life out of us. But God wants us to, to come to him and to trust him and to say, Lord, I understand that you know the future. The third thing is to yield ourselves to God's purpose. You know, it's, it really will take the joy out of your life if you don't have a purpose in life. We've got to have a purpose. You've got to have a cause beyond yourself, bigger than yourself. That will give you joy in your life. If you don't have a big purpose, you're just drifting through life. And it's amazing how many people drift through life. They don't have a plan. They don't have any thoughts about the future. We've got to have a plan. And, and in the plan, we present it to God and we say, God, what's, what is it that you're, you're, uh, you're doing and it's important for us. Yes? You see, Paul, when he was writing this letter, he lost everything. He was in jail, as I said. He was old. He was lonely. Everybody deserted him. He was in a, in a dire situation. He was waiting to be executed. And yet, in the midst of that, he was able to be able to write this letter. And he was able to have joy because he had a purpose greater than just the present circumstance or his situation or what he could get out of that. Amen? In other words, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21 says this, For me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. In other words, if you want to have joy in your life, you've got to have a cause greater than yourself. And Paul's cause was Christ. And because of that, he was able, even in that dark situation, that he was able to have joy and to write about joy. And when we get in line with God's purpose for our life, joy goes up in our life. Romans 6 says this, Give yourselves completely to God, every part of you, to be tools in the hand of God 
to be used for his good purpose. In other words, the most dangerous prayer that you could pray is, God, use me and mean it. Because God is looking for people to use. And if you get usable, he will wear you out. And you will be filled with joy that even in the darkest of times, you will be able to do, be like Paul. <coughs> the F stands for focus on what is good. We've got to focus on what is good. If we stop focusing on the negative, and we, you know, we have a choice in life, we can either focus on the positive things or focus on the negative things. But it is something that we can do. We've got to realize that life is filled with ups and downs. It's filled with mountains and valleys. It is filled with good times and bad times. It is filled with critics and compliments. But it's a choice is whether we have joy in our life. It's a choice what we focus on. And so my um, hope is that we, you would make it a daily thing to focus on what is good. Yes, uh, on, on, it's a choice that you have. And so the fourth joy builder is in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Fix your thoughts, that's your focus. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy. In other words, what you focus on matters. And Paul is saying these are the things to focus on. Is something good? Is something lovely? Is it pure? Is it admirable? You know, is it, is it noble? Is it, is it what, what is it if he's going to... Now, I want to say to you, let me ask you a question. Where are you going to get things like that to fill your mind with? Because in our mind, we have a lot of negative things that come into us. We don't have to think about negative things to have negative things coming in to our mind. So we have got to consciously put the positive into our life. That, is that right? And so, so, for example, are you going to get to know the things that are lovely and admirable and true and noble um, and, and excellent and praiseworthy? Are you going to be able to get those things from the radio or the TV uh, or magazines? Highly unlikely because the main primary thing that you and I can get, faith, soul, food, is from the Word of God. And that's why we've got to spend time in the Word of God, just reading the Word of God, soaking in the Word of God, so that we get our mind thinking the things that God wants us to think about. Amen? And we've got to do that every day. Fill our mind every day with the things that God wants us to do. And Paul practiced that. In his prison situation, he had every reason to be bitter. He had every reason to complain Oh, my circumstances, the situation, there's no hope. This is what was going to happen to me. But he didn't. He took advantage of it. I want to say to you, I think that Paul, when he was tied to those Roman soldiers, just thought, well, I'm going to tell them the gospel. And so you think that every, <clears throat> every four hours, the Roman soldiers that he's tied to are changing. And he was in prison for, for, for quite a long time. They reckon that he's probably been able to preach the gospel to thousands of, of Roman soldiers. And some of them Roman soldiers went, we know, back into Nero's household. And people in Nero's household got saved as a result of Paul sharing the gospel in prison with those that he was tied with. And instead of mourning about his situation, he used his opportunity to share the gospel. In other words, he was filled with the joy of the Lord. He was praising the Lord. Paul and Silas in prison, they were able to sing praises at midnight. Even though they were chained, they were able to see them and God works. I want to say to you, God works when we praise him. God works when we change what we focus 
focusing on and don't focus on the situation, but focus the God of the situation, amen? That he's the God who of the turnaround, the God of the breakthrough, the God who can do all things, and we have got to have that in our life. That We have got to do, as I was talking this morning, we've got to have the, jo- the, the, the shout of praise. When the shout of praise goes on, the enemy goes to flight and God starts to work. In Jericho, there was a shout of praise to God and the walls fell down. I want to say to you, if we would shout more the things of God and get excited about the things... Now, I like shouting. (laughs) Just in case you hadn't noticed. (laughs) And my dad, he likes shouting. So it kind of follows in the family tradition. Um, Now, some people I know, if they were to shout full volume, I don't even think the mice would look around and uh, they'd kind of go, did you say something? Um, uh, But but, but I I like a shout. But what's great is we know that God shouts. In fact, Jesus is coming back with a shout. (laughs) I'm looking forward to that. So the shout, anyway, I don't know why I got onto that. But 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 it's important because the shout... There's different types of shouting, isn't there? Obviously, you can shout to tell somebody off, and we often think of the negative. But actually, we can shout something positive. When you go to a football match, and they're shouting, they're shouting encouragement to their team. We'll forget about the bits that they shout with the other. But anyway, but all I'm saying is, is there's, why, why are you going to shout? Because they're trying to vocalise what's in them. And if God is in you, then he needs to come out. He needs to express it. Because God wants us to share what's in us. So if the joy is in us, it will come out, will it not? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm preaching better than you're responding, all I can say. <clears throat> and the you... Use your life to help others. Why was Paul joyful? Because he was unselfish. He wasn't thinking about himself. I want to tell you, this is a tough one. It's so easy to think about yourself, isn't it? Am I the only one that thinks about myself in here? We do, don't we? We think about ourselves, yeah? But what Paul did was he invested his life in other people. Where the people around him, he was constantly giving out. It didn't matter what the cost was, whether he was getting beaten, whether he was getting stoned, and I don't mean with alcohol. And he, and, and, and he was getting kind of let down, uh, down, down the side of a, a city, whether or not he was uh, being shipwrecked. It didn't matter whether he was getting lashes. It didn't matter what was happening. He still was investing in other people. Some hurt him, but even in the midst of being hurt, He expressed love. He expressed what was in him. And joy comes from that. If we stop focusing on our small little puny problems and started to focus on helping others, it would bring joy into our life. It changed something. If you don't believe me, just try it. Just try helping other people and focusing on other people. It does something in you that's bigger than anything else. You can't be selfish and joyful at the same time. It, uh, it comes from serving others. Philippians 4 says this, Dear brothers and sisters, I love you and I long to see you, for you are my joy and the reward for my work. You see, there Paul was saying, You are my joy. The people that he had invested in. He wasn't looking at possessions. He wasn't looking at at, at his accolades. He wasn't looking at his achievements. He wasn't looking at anything else. He was looking at the people that he had served and shared the gospel with. And they had responded. And he said, you are my joy. I think that's so important for us, isn't it? He had invested his life. Now, for most of us, I think, we have probably heard of the famous line, in Shakespeare's play (coughs) from Hamlet, which is, to be or not to be, yes? Well, actually, what he is, what what, uh, the, the Prince of Denmark is talking about there is suicide. In other words, is it more painful to live or is it more painful to die? And he's got this dilemma because he's looking and thinking, whichever way I go, it's painful. Well, I want to say to you that Paul asked the same question, but he asked it from a different perspective. You see, Paul said about whether he lived or died, 
He just goes from the, expect, from the opposite um, uh, 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 vantage point, perspective, and he's saying this, I don't know which is better, to stay here with you or to be with the Lord. In other words, Paul said, whether I live or whether I die, I win. If I win, I belong to Christ. And, you know, so if I, if I live, I belong to Christ. If I die, I belong to Christ. Whatever happens to me, I win. And when you have that perspective, life changes completely, doesn't it? So let me ask you a question. What do you have to live for? What is your perspective? Do you have a purpose for living? Do you have a purpose for dying? What is your purpose in life? I believe is so important for us to ask. You see, Paul said, for me to live is... Make me ask you the question. You answer that yourself and just say that. Whatever is for me to live is, and then whatever that blank is, what is it for you? Because if it's pleasure, if it's, if it's anything that's the thing with accolades, achievements, all these kind of things, they're never going to be enough in life because them things could easily be taken away from you, yes? Where if you have something that has eternity at the very, at the very core of it, then you can, whatever is thrown at you, you have a purpose to live and to die for. And so that's going to do. So, and and um, the last one is learn to be content. This is the last joy bill of, of, of the ones that Paul says. In other words, he says in verse 11, he says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. Yeah, and, and as we've heard, if you read Paul's life, you realize that he went through some major uh, things. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> we have a little bit of his biography, and I'll read it. He says this, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received 40 lashes minus one. So you think of that, 39 times five, whatever that is for you mathematicians. So you can imagine he had fair few wounds on his back, didn't he, yes? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been in constant danger. I've labored and toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I've even been cold and gone without clothing. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. In spite of all this, no matter what happens, rejoice. In all situations, rejoice in the Lord. Always rejoice. In other words, Paul says, I've learned to be content. But whatever the circumstances, whatever the situations, he learned to be content. Joy is a decision that you and I make. And my prayer is that you will make uh, the, the right decisions and decide what you're going to focus on. Re, you know, jettison all the regrets. Omit all the worries about the future. You're going to start to think about how you can live for the purpose greater than you, for the purposes of God, and asking God, say, God, use me, and, and look for, for where God is working, and, and, and say, Lord, I want to I give my life to help other people. If you will do that, it will change you. The problem is, is we live with a when and then thinking. When this happens, then I'll be happy. When I get married, then I'll be happy. When I get a job, then I'll be happy. When I leave school, then I'll be happy. When I get my degree, then I'll be happy. Whatever it might be, the problem is, is we get that and we're still not happy because then we want the next thing, don't we? Because the problem is, is if all the, if our happiness depends on everything that's above the line, then whenever something is below the line, there's always something else above the line. Does that make sense? So in other words... If, uh, if below the line, if we'll think this is a line, if everything below the line is the things that we already have, yes, and the things above the, 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 the line, the pulpit, are the things that we haven't got but we would like, then the, the, the problem is, is if our happiness depends on getting those things below the line, we're always 
going to be uh, uh, miserable. Because, so I'll give you an example. Say, for example, you buy a nice brand new TV. And this brand new TV has the latest, it's got Bluetooth and it's got uh, uh, HDMI and it, it's thing, you know, like the new Sky thing that's out. It's got the Sky box is integral to it. Now, maybe that's over here and you think, oh, I'd love a Sky TV. The problem is, is once you get the Sky TV, you think, okay, if I get that Sky TV, I'm going to be happy. The problem is, is they then bring out another TV that's even better. And then the next TV, and you think, oh no, but that's got surround sound and it's got this and got that. So what I'm saying to you is, if what you need in your life is what you haven't got, for you to be content and joyful, you're never going to make it. It's never going to happen. You've got to, you've got to focus your life. You've got to look at your life and say, I'm going to focus on the things that have eternity rather than what's just right now. Amen? And when we look with that, we can change things in the future because God will get a hold of those things. My, my whole aim, uh, should I say God's aim for every one of us is for us to be filled with abundant joy. Today, do you think you can sing this last song with abundant joy? Yeah, we leap off our seats. Yes, and we could even, ra- I mean, think about that, raising your hand. Oh, such expressions. Amen? Can you do that? Let's sing, let's praise Him, let's shout of joy and praise to God because of who He is, because He can make everything new. Amen.